Thank you. I am I'm thrilled to be here and very honored to be here on Easter, which according to my research is based on the celebration of the pre-Christian goddess of spring. So that's what I'm celebrating. I'm celebrating spring. And this goddess name was Yoister, E-O-S-T-R-E. And then the Christians stole that and made it something else. But for me, it's a celebration of spring. So thank you so much for those that made it possible for me to be here and, and share my passion, my chairs. Um, I'd like to uh, share my screen now and go to my, my slides. Excellent. All right, this, uh, this first piece is a self-portrait that I call Unchained. And for me, it's um, about me being a free spirit, a free thinker, that I am not bound by religion or the morals of religion and society, that I am my own person. And I'm very glad to be here with other free thinkers. My first social commentary chair is one that I painted back in 2004. This is my uh, parody of the Ten Commandments. I had been reading about this group and their quest to get rid of the statue of the Ten Commandments in the Duluth Courthouse. And I thought, I'm gonna do art commandments Instead, so I painted um, on this small chair, I painted Charleston Heston as Moses holding up a palette instead of the, the tablet. And I made all the commandments based on the Ten Commandments, only changed them to be art commandments. And you can see them listed here. Uh, one of them is thou shalt not take the name of Van Gogh in vain. And another one on the back is my favorite, that thou shalt not kiln the clay until it is dry. So I really want to thank the free thinkers for getting me started on my, my goal of doing um, social commentary chairs. Here's another one that was based on something I saw in the Duluth newspaper. And this one is called Roadkill. And I saw the photograph in the paper and decided to do um, a piece about the apathy. Here is a you know, road construction crew just painting over a dead animal, you know, not having time to scrape it off or whatever. Of course, they weren't gonna have a funeral for it, but again, it's just, again, symbolic of the apathy of our society. And even just recently, you know, I guess you could pertain it to what's happening with the Asian Americans. Um, that just recently, one elderly Asian American was beaten and the bystanders just stood by. Nobody called the police, nobody tried to stop him. So uh, a lot of my chairs even though they were painted years ago, still pertain to what's happening in our society today. This piece is called The Death of a Marriage, dealing with the issue of divorce. This is my dress. I wore it twice. I wore it when I was married and 20 years later, I wore it to my divorce. So I cut it in half, glued it on this chair, the one side representing marriage and the other side representing divorce. I broke a mirror and glued that to the seat to represent broken dreams, broken promises. I kept this dress in a box for 20 years and the box is underneath the seat, I stapled it. I often put secrets 
um, underneath the seat of the chairs and I paint. This piece is called Things on a Stick and it was painted for the Minnesota State Fair. And I got a list of the things that you can get at the State Fair on a stick. And those are the animals I painted on top. Then um, the different spindles are the shish kebabs. And then on the seat, I painted a roller coaster. Uh, Chris, you need Along to move, move your slide forward one. This is, you're not seeing the State Fair? No, it's, we, we, I see the divorce slide. I see the right one. I see, I see the State Fair as well. I okay. see the State okay. Fair. State Fair. We've okay. lost the uh, picture. Up. It's just Charles's 56 baud Com CompuServe. All right, so the poem that I wrote at the top of the roller coaster, if you can see my cursor, is I've been on a roller coaster ride, my stomach's churning deep inside, mm -hmm. up, down, all around, no hope can be found. I want the ride to stop and stay high up on top, but I keep spinning round, going down to the ground. I surmise, no compromise, I have to get off. So I'd like to advise you, if you feel you are being skewered by life, to get on a new track. This piece is called Empty Heart. It was painted in 2010 for the Minneapolis Institute of Art. Um, it deals with a couple facing infertility. And little did I know that 11 years later, my own children would be facing this. So I feel that my chairs are like my grandchildren. Hopefully someday I will have some, but until then, the soul of my life is in my chairs. This piece I could talk about for an hour, but I won't. This piece is called, Bless Me Father, For I Have Sinned. I was raised in a family where my mother was Catholic and my father was an atheist. On their wedding day, he had to promise to raise his children Catholic. So on the chair, you can see this is myself, this is my sister Lori and my sister Jan and my mother. We are all dressed in our first communion dress. And in the Catholic Church, this happens in second grade when you're approximately seven years old. We are all on the stairway to heaven because at that time I believed the only way I could get to heaven was to confess my sins to a priest. So here is my prayer book from that First Communion. My gloves, my rosary, my nun doll that my godmother gave me, chained to the chair with her rosary. This represents hell underneath the legs. The burned dress around it because I do feel I was burned by the Catholic Church. My father stuck to his promise, so for the first three years of our schooling, we went to a Catholic Church until our first communion. Then I felt I was free. In third grade, I got to go to the public school. And I can honestly say, I do not remember kindergarten, first grade, or second grade. I really only remember my first communion through the photographs that I have of that day. I believe also that the priests are the ones that are the sinners. They're the ones that 
thousands of them have abused 10,000s of children, and the church just passed them along. Those are the true sinners, I believe. These are my parents. Well, I got to go back now. Okay. I put the portraits of my parents into a love seat. And I have displayed this chair called the Catholic and the Atheist in galleries where I ask people to sit in the love seat with somebody else face to face that they have a disagreement with and to discuss this disagreement and probably find some common ground. My parents were married for 68 years. I never heard them argue. My father died on Thanksgiving at the age of 96 in his own home, in his own bed, holding hands with my mother. So in honor of him, I painted this stool and I display it on my turkey platter every Thanksgiving. It's actually a carcass from um, a deer that I had seen, but I call this piece leftovers because when someone you love dies, all you have left over are their memories. And because it was on Thanksgiving, I am very thankful for my father and the upbringing that I had. This piece is called The Uprising, dealing with the ugliness of the colonizing of North America. It shows the contrast between the old Native American and the new Native American. One is leaning against a telegraph pole, which was said to have helped the defeat of the Indian nations. And the other Native American, I'm glad to say, is my brother-in-law, Jackson. And he's in the parking lot of the Black Bear Casino, which have been said to help and better the lives of the indigenous people. This piece is called Gone, and it deals with bringing the awareness to the murdered and missing indigenous women. This chair is now on display at the Fond du Lac College in Cloquet. It shows the three red ghosts that are symbolic of the thousands of women that are reported missing every year. The Thunderbirds are symbolic of power, protection, and strength. This piece is called The Grass is Always Greener on the Other Side of the Fence, dealing with drugs. The one side of the fence, I painted the poster from the 1936 movie Reefer Madness that was full of propaganda but made people so fearful of allowing medical marijuana that it um, is just recently being accepted. When I painted this chair, the Minnesota legislature um, was having a debate on TV that I watched about proposing a bill for medical marijuana. So this was um, back in 2009. At that time, there were only, let's see, I think there are only um, 12 states that legalized medical marijuana. And those I've listed on the joints here on the back of the chair. Now, recently, there is 36 states that allow medical marijuana.
This shows the back of the chair where I listed, based on the search in general, the death tolls from tobacco, alcohol, prescription drugs, illegal drugs, aspirin, no death tolls for marijuana. This piece is called Half in the Bag, Dealing with Drunk Driving. For an upcoming art show, we were asked to make an art piece dealing with a brown bag. I had just been to the liquor store and bought a Fetzer bottle of wine. So I used that brown bag and changed the label to play on words dealing with boozer, do not drink and drive. This is uh, my hand reaching for the wine bottle. I still drink. Um, at five o'clock, I usually have a glass of wine, but I always have my designated driver, my partner, John. This is his uh, DUI glued to the chair. And this is his 10 year medal from AA. He is now 23 years sober. There is also a broken wine glass on this chair. And this is from a mother whose son was killed and two of his best friends while he was driving drunk. At the bottom of this chair, I have a Crown Royal liquor bag filled with obituaries. This is the stool of my mother and all the drugs that she was taking. She was uh, told that she had congestive heart disease and that she only had six months to live if she did not have this operation. She decided not to have the operation and live for another four and a half years. She died uh, at 94 at her home with hospice. And that was her choice. She did not want to risk dying on the operating table. This piece is Darwin's Tree Evolving. I didn't know this group celebrates Darwin's birthday every year. Um, so this chair deals with science versus faith. This tree of life is actually from Darwin's notebook, not with all the animals on it, but just the basic tree um, in his notebook from 1837 when he was working on the theory of evolution. And I do believe that all life is related and ever changing. This piece is about recycling. Every spring I collect garbage around the lake. And one year I decided to take all that garbage, What you can see here, there is, this is from a radial steel belted tire, uh, cans and a battery, bottles. All of these things I created into the Loch Mess Monster of Big Lake based on, of course, the Loch Ness Monster. I even found a lock on my walk and put that onto the chair. This piece is called The Eve of Destruction, dealing with overpopulation. Are humans the next dinosaur heading for extinction? Will the earth become uninhabitable because of air and water pollution? Will deforestation and climate change cause Florida, which would have been here, and New York, which would have been here, to sink into the ocean? Well, these are questions that this piece asks. Even here, this is a bone to represent and symbolize fossil fuel. 
This chair was actually carried um, on an Earth Day march in Duluth. But I do hope that this doomsday forecast will not change. I mean, this will not happen. This is a piece of uh, another self-portrait uh, from when I had gave birth to my son. And it was for another Earth Day show. This was at the Lizard Gallery. And they asked us to paint something that had to do with Mother Earth. So I decided to paint this. And if you look here, this is symbolic of the universe. The sperm here is impregnating the egg or earth. Um, I like to think that we are made of stardust, which is one of the scientific theories, and that eventually the planet will blow up and become stardust again. But the interesting note is that this piece was bought by the Immaculate Conception Church in Minneapolis. This piece is called Love is a Family Value, painted in the year 2010, five years before the Supreme Court granted and recognized same-sex marriage. On the back, it shows all the countries at that time, there were only 12 countries in 2010 that allowed same-sex marriage. Now there are 29 countries that do. But I based a lot of my um, pictures on, this is from an icon of St. Sergius and St. Bacchus with the image that some scholars believe is Jesus, and that he is sanctioning the marriage between these two males. They were Roman soldiers. They later on became martyrs, Christian martyrs. And so I created this marriage certificate and for the year 3003, when they would have been living. 303. This piece is called The Three Tales of Poe. Edgar Allan Poe was um, very good at sim symbolizing his work. And these three plays, the, um, the Raven, the Telltale Heart, and the Pit and the Pendulum, all dealt with death and social and religious persecution. This piece is Billie Holiday singing Strange Fruit, dealing with racial injustice. I have a string to represent the lynchings that she sings about in the song. And while I painted this, I listened to the song over and over and over again. It's very moving. Uh, you can see it on YouTube, uh, very emotional. And um, this piece went on display for uh, the uh, J Jazz Festival in St. Paul in the year 2010. This piece is called Phil Wanted in hopes that people would donate money and put them in this bowl when it was on display. Well, people would steal the money, <laughs> maybe because they needed it. So um, I ended up donating it to um, the Second Harvest Food Shelf. This chair is called Van Gogh's Chair Emerging. I'm often inspired by other artists. 
And Van Gogh faced many challenges in his life. He only sold one painting, but that never stopped him from painting what he wanted. At the bottom of this piece on the frame, I wrote his quote. The voices of those critics that try to constrict me sound shrill and false. I painted this because it was in a response to those critics that I felt were discriminating against me because my work was on a chair and not framed on a flat canvas. So I chose to mount my chair on a frame, on a canvas, and then frame it and display it that way. This is another piece dealing with rejection. Um, I created this piece after the pop artist Rory Lichtenstein. His painting was called Masterpiece. My painting is called Not Accepted. Roy Lichtenstein's work was not often accepted until he had a big show and then somebody discovered him and then he became very famous. But he often received many rejection slips. So this is me and my partner, John, with my chair and the letter not accepted. I did submit this chair for a pop art show at the Duluth Art Institute and it was not accepted. So that letter is stapled to the bottom of this chair. This piece is called The Open Mind after the TV show, um, the PBS TV show that is considered the longest running weekly TV series. It started in 1956 and you can still watch it it was started by Richard Hefner, and now his grandson is a host. Martin Luther King was one of the first guests on this show. And I'm proud to say that it was purchased by um, the WDESE, and it is in their lobby. This piece deals with the Civil War. And as my t-shirt says, if you can see it, I believe in art, not war. Make art, not war. But I painted this for a Christmas show. Um, the poem Christmas Bells was written by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow on Christmas Eve while caring for his son that had been shot in the Civil War. He heard the Christmas bells in the background. So when people sing this song at Christmas time, they often omit this verse, which is the one I painted on the chair. Then from each black accursed mouth, the cannon thundered in the south, and with the sound, the carols drowned of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Now, if you can follow my arrow cursor, you can see I have painted in the profile of Lincoln here. If you look at the dead body here, you can see that's his eye and then follow along. This is his nose, his mouth, his chin of Abraham Lincoln. This piece is called Empty Seat at Sandy Hook dealing with gun violence in schools. This memorial is made for the first, the 21st graders and six educators that were killed on December 14th, 2012. I painted 20 coats of primer on this elementary school chair. And I would say each child's name that I've listed here to represent their lost innocence. I also wrote the six educators in the center as the sun, and I painted six coats of varnish over this chair and said their names because they were the protectors of these children. Up at the top, I painted the killers, 
chaotic eyes, I do not paint his name on there. But on the back, I've painted the six or the three guns that he used to kill all those innocent lives. Underneath the chair is a teddy bear. This teddy bear represents the 65,000 teddy bears that were sent to Sandy Hook after the massacre. When I display this piece, I encourage people to pick up the teddy bear and to say the names of the victims so that they will not be forgotten. The killing chair deals with capital punishment. I painted this in 2016 after reading an article in the Time Magazine. And I gave this to Fred Friedman after his Free Thinkers speech a couple months ago. He promised me that he would promote the end of the death penalty. So far, 27 states still allow the death penalty. Minnesota is not one of them. On the chair, I show the six different ways that executions and the death penalty, capital punishment have been carried out since the 1700s. But I believe in the research that claims capital punishment does not deter murder. This piece is called Woman in Blue, about the empowerment of woman. I painted this for the WTF show in Duluth, which stands for What the Feminist. And my subject was Annie. She is the first woman to bicycle across the world in 1895. And it's been said that the bicycle was the most influential things to help emancipate women. This shows Annie on her first day wearing her corset, long dress, woman's bicycle. This shows her on her last day, a year and a half later. Has her bloomers on, looks more confident. She succeeded. Another woman dealing with feminism called the Unveiled Woman. This was painted for an archo at the Zeitgeist. I chose to paint a still life because during Renaissance times, the monkey in a still life would represent chaos in the world. When I painted this two years ago, I felt the world was in great chaos. Also, this apple, since biblical times, has stood for the fall of man. And the statue was symbolic for me to represent the rise of woman. This chair was... Um, painted from a newspaper article dealing with this town in Texas that was trying to stop Trump from starting to build his wall right through their park, the Santa Ana Wildlife Refuge in Texas. The townspeople got together, that's how they survived. That was their livelihood with the tourists that came to visit this beautiful refuge where many of the animals would have been destroyed if they were allowed to build this wall through the park. So because of this protest, the, um, the US House barred Trump from building the first piece of the new wall there. So it worked. It also is based on the poem. Down here you see on the seat, the poem um, is from Robert Frost. The poem is called Something There Is That Doesn't Love a Wall. 
and I wrote that poem on the back of this chair. But I painted, um, it's about two neighbors. One has an apple orchard and one has a tree farm. And they have this stone wall that separates their properties. And as they're repairing the stone wall together, the one neighbor says, why do we have this wall? We don't need a wall. My apples won't be eaten by your trees. We don't need a wall. But the neighbor just keeps on replying, good fences make good neighbors. So that's where that saying came from, from Robert Frost. This is my dump trump truck, or elect a clown, expect a circus. When I often go up in my garage where I have 200 chairs that I try to find the perfect chair to paint my theme. And when I was looking at all the chairs I had in storage up there, I saw one that was broken. And I thought that's perfect because I believe that the Republican party is broken. So I put a little elephant up there to symbolize that. Um, this is my neighbor's truck that I filled with the garbage that Trump has did during his term, electing conservative judges, all the, the 25 um, claims against sexual misconduct, some of them by the university, Miss Universe. The mailbox is symbolic of his claim that the mail in ballots were fraudulent. And the last little bear climbing the tree and which the tree becomes the Washington Monument is symbolic of his defunding of the Bears Grand National Monument, Bears Ears. I gave this piece to Michelle Lee during her campaign. Unfortunately, she lost, but fortunately, so did Trump. And I am going to end. This is my last piece. These are the 33 social commentary chairs that I have painted. Um, I have painted 536 chairs, but only 33 are the ones I showed you of my social commentary. And this one is called Outwitted, based on acceptance. And I wrote the poem around the back of the chair. And this is by Edwin Markham, who wrote it in 1898. He drew a circle that shut me out, heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle and took him in. So I hope that you enjoyed what I have showed. And I now would like to, um, I can go back. You can ask me questions about any of these pieces. I um, appreciate your comments. I uh, wanna state that I am not an expert on any of these issues. I did my research and I hope that it was an honest presentation of my art, my voice. I created these pieces because they're important to me. And then I encourage all of you to find a creative niche in your life. So that's the end of my presentation. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank uh, you, Chris. I, you know, Jim, uh, this, is, this is Charles. So I'll, I'll overcome my shyness long enough to make a, uh, a comment. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Chris, for a really, not only enlightening, but really enjoyable tour of your, of your work. Uh, now, you know as an artist that once you release a piece of work, it is no longer yours. Uh, it becomes uh, something that the, the beholder can see what they, what they see in it, rather than necessarily what you intended. And so the little bear climbing the Washington Monument 
uh, to me represents the rise of Russian interests in American politics. And um, I think it's, uh, that's exactly what it said to me when I saw it. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and, yeah. Not that one, keep going. Okay, you see it now? It was right at the end. No, at the end. It, it'll take him a minute to catch up. Oh, you see it, Charles. Anyway, that's my comment. Hey, Chris, I wondered if you could say something about your personal journey, uh, flesh it out a little bit more. So we know you went to, uh, uh, when you were seven, you were in the church. How did you uh, leave the church and what led you to uh, being a free thinker? Well, I was very influenced by my father and who was very open-minded and um, started to taking me to the Unitarian Church in, um, in Minneapolis in St. Paul. That's a gateway religion. Yeah. <laughs> and I was probably 13 and that is when I stopped believing in God. I just, um, it just did not make sense to me. Um, and it's interesting because I had, you know, the Jehovah's Witness always stop by with their Bible and I'm ready. I have my atheist Bible that I say, you read a verse and then I'm going to read you a verse from my Bible. But um, one of the, the, there was a woman that came and she said, how can you f have any morals if you don't believe in God and you don't have a church? And I said, well, my parents taught me their morals that, you know, you're not good just because you believe in God. But um, my parents taught me how to be a very moral person, a very honest person, and to search for the truth, not just blanketly believe something that I'm told. Yeah. Now, I don't know if my sisters uh, can want to comment on that either. What happened with the rest of your sisters uh, in that in that realm. Well, Jan or Lori, do you want to say how oh, I don't think either of them are believe in God, right, Jan? Are you there? Yeah. Lori? Um, <laughs> I consider myself an agnostic. Yeah. The, the chair about infertility. Yes. I um I just ran, I, I wish I could remember, I'm not very good at remembering anything anymore, but I, I either read or heard just in the last month that American males, it was either 56 or 59%, American males have 56% fewer sperm per ejaculation or, or per liter or whatever it is than males than U.S. males about a half a century ago. I read that too. You did? Okay. I don't remember which one it was, but the number is so big, it, it really surprised me. And How many do you really need? Yeah, well, I don't know. You, you don't need a lot, but it's, a, it's a, a trend that's probably from, I don't know. So, Bill, Bill that's, that's just the planet trying to save itself. It could be, yeah. <laughs> Most people think it's from plastics, uh, uh, the, the change in our hormones from pla plastics. A lot, a lot of uh, reproductive things are changing in females too. Uh, so anyway, kind of interesting. I thought of that when I saw your picture. Do you expect or would be offended by people sitting on these chairs? Well, like someone said, once it leaves, once somebody buys it, it's, it's not up to me anymore. Um, I don't, I have notes that say, do not sit on chairs when they're on display. And if somebody buys one, I say, you know, um, use it delicately. It's, it's not meant to be sat on every day and used. I hope that they use it um, gently or display it on the wall. They could hang it or in a corner, like a sculpture. You're not gonna sit on a sculpture. But um, 
But as long as it's gently used, that's what I encourage. And again, it, it's up to the person that buys it, how they're gonna use it. You know, Chris, I noticed you had some rituals associated with some of the chairs, in particular, the, the Sandy Hook chair, where you did the 20 coats and, yeah. and so forth. And also you've got all these symbols in the chairs. Um, both of these are characteristic of religion. So religions have lots of symbols and they have lots of rituals. And it's something we're missing, in, I think. It, ap it, it appeals to people as part of our nature to like rituals and symbols. And we really don't have it in uh, free thinkers. You give up all that when you give up uh, religion, uh, unless you're making chairs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, rituals are important. But uh, I noticed that uh, I just sold a resort I had for 28 years. And the families that had to have the same cabin in the same week every year. And it, it went through ge a generation and a half sometime in my experience. Where, and, and I thought, boy, that must somehow that, that must offer a lot of stability or feeling of security or continuity, or I don't even know, but it, it, uh, it's very appealing. And people are very, they get a lot of tenacity to hang on to it. While we're still on this chair, if I can jump in and, and say something. I know Chris, <clears throat> a lot of, excuse me, <clears throat> a lot of your healing comes in these pieces while you're creating your pieces. And so specifically on this chair, um, this was for many people, but speaking from my own experience, such a hard, such a hard devastation to grasp. And even now, and as you were presenting it, this piece allows me to process and heal. And so I can still feel all the weight and all the upset from that day when I look at this piece. And so I guess I have appreciation for you creating something like this so I can continue to heal all these years later as I'm seeing something like this. Yes, yes, thank you, Sarah. My, my art is very therapeutic. And I often cry when I'm painting a chair too. It's, um, it is a very emotional thing, especially this chair was very difficult. And the one on the Civil War, just man's inhumanity. It's just hard to understand sometimes. This is Barbara and I was, amazed how your relevancy continues. Like today in the Denver Post, there was an article on same-sex marriage, on Indians, and oh gosh, I think there was another one too. So it's just like your relevancy is just continual. So that's, that's exciting too. Thank you. Yep. Chris, this is Linda. Um, I'm curious about your process of working your chairs are fabulous. I just, I'm amazed by them. But do you plan them all out before you start? Or do they evolve as you're working on them? Um, both. I, first of all, I'll have an idea. I'll have a theme. And then I'll look at the chairs I have in storage to find which one fits the personality of my theme. Um, like with this one, I mean, I had only one child's chair. This is actually from a cloquet elementary school and they were throwing it out. So I took it. Um, and usually a chair takes me 15 to 20 hours from the beginning to the end. Um, and it is, things do evolve as I, as I paint them too. Um, but I, I do a lot of research and do a sketch sometimes before I start. I think, um, you know, I was gonna, um, with, with this one, all of a sudden it's this poor, this profile of Lincoln just appeared. It was very strange how that happened. Um, and then I, and then I emphasized it a little more, but it just kind of came there. I don't know if you can see that it's, mm -hmm if I draw around it. Mm -hmm. So things do, do evolve 
as I paint them. So Chris, I wondered, uh, this is a multi-part question. I wondered if you had some other ideas that you were uh, incubating. I also wondered if you considered other media, like uh, I was thinking headboards from beds would be good <laughs> because they're, they're kind of, they're easy to store, they're planar, they're flat, and you can represent the, any occupants of the bed by a pillow and a head and put messages up above and other things if you wanted to decorate that way. I, I have been asked, yeah, to paint other things, but I only do chairs because to me, it's like a person. They have many of the same parts. There's a back, their legs, their arms, there's, you know, the seat. Um, and it's, it's easy to pick up a chair. And I work on an old um, weightlifting bench from my son that I sit on and straddle it and then put the chair on top and paint it. Um, and I just, uh, you know, if things are too big, like a dresser, I, I, that's too heavy for me to handle. So I only do chairs again, because there, for some reason, it struck a chord with me. I had tried uh, weaving and watercolor and many other different um, arts media, but found my true passion with chairs. Something just really struck a chord with me. And I've never wavered since uh, 1996 when I painted my first chair. Um, then the, the other part of the question was about ideas for future uh, chairs. No, I, I am looking for some. So if you have some suggestions, <laughs> usually it's something I read about or something that just really um, is upsetting to me when I do one of my social commentary chairs. Uh, I'm always doing flowers and animals and things like that. But yes, if you have some ideas, please. Well, animals them and flowers are way too cheerful. How about a pandemic chair? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Something, some aspect of it. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. I'm struck by the uh, response to violence and cruelty that you're uh, concerned with. And I've been thinking lately that uh, that is the normal state of humanity. Uh, it, we have been a savage species from, you know, early on. You had to be to survive. And I think um, somehow we've gotten the idea that peace is a, a possibility or that uh, this sort of going running amok and killing people is unusual. But I don't think, I think it's part of us. And, and that that's the standard state of mankind. I don't know what that's worth as an observation, but I, I have that feeling. Well, there's always hope for change, that we can become a more peaceful union. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but I think children ought to be brought up to expect uh, horror and violence. I mean, I know in my neighborhood growing up, um, my parents didn't tell me about it, but I learned on the playground and in the streets that uh, you better watch out for yourself. And then I lived through World War II, you know, and, and uh, a lot of people feel uh, glorious about going to war and killing and all this sort of thing. But I found from the newsreels were enough to tell me, boy, this is a dangerous place, this world. Well, you, uh, I uh, disagree with, um... Bill, at my own peril, of course, uh, I, uh, I think that human nature changes very, very little and very, very slowly. But I do think that societal standards and expectations improve over time. We don't, we don't lo no longer you know, tolerate things that were tolerated as recently as 100 years ago. And uh, just the, the picture of the woman that drove her bike around the world is very a telling because within the few years that she did that, uh, the norms changed, expectations changed. And I think that, yeah, the people have a violent streak and it's always going to be there, but our expectations of how much violence we tolerate can change. 
And I, I see hope in the fact that individuals change. Um, you know, the streak towards violence kind of has always been a part of us, but I, I see the hope in, in, in individuals can change. Well, I think the survival of humanity of our earth depends on peace and our finding a way to change, you know, compromise, diplomacy, not war. Well, I think the atomic, uh, I take the atomic weapon standoff. Uh, so there, a certain amount of peace depends on uh, the capability of, of wild destruction. We like to live in a, in a, I like to live in a community that is peaceful and, you know, and, and allows for my happiness. But how about, how I have about, to, but Bill, just to take uh, your, your example one step further, for the first time in history, human beings have weapons that they are not using. Uh, and, you know, so we do learn a little bit, maybe not enough and not fast enough, but we have, we have the last 75 years, we've had weapons that we no longer use. Here's uh, my view a little bit on that topic. Um, as long as there's a higher, a, a much higher percentage of people that have more, more to lose with chaos and violence than, than they could gain, that's, that's what tips the scale. You, you, desperation, starvation, Actually, the world full of 8 billion people and maybe 2 billion of them having to relocate on the planet over the next 100 years, that, that does not sound like a peaceful situation to me. But anyway, we're, we're on our way towards that future, I would assume. And that, that will involve raising the percentage of people who have who in their minds think they have more to gain than to lose with violence. So things back up, they don't always go forward. The eve of destruction. <laughs> uh, taking the I was gonna say, uh, taking the conversation in a different direction. Um, can you tell me why you uh, nailed a chair to the outside of your garage, Mom? Oh, <laughs> because it's like the shoe keeper. That's my sign. Uh, this is where the chair lady lives. Okay. That's the reason. Got it. Believe it or not, I have to go up and make two different kinds of coffee for Easter dinner today. And it's, it does have ham too. The irony of ham is with me in this house. So thank you very much, Chris. I have to go. Bye, Bill. Chris, I, yes. I know you, you mentioned a few places around town where we might be able to see, what, see your chairs. Um, where? Can we look if we want to go on a Chris Nelson expedition? <laughs> um, I have three galleries where my work is shown. Uh -huh. uh, lizards in Duluth, Art on the Planet in Superior, and the Encore in Cloquet. Also, yeah, I have a website, chairsbychris.com, where you can see my work too. Well, this has certainly been impressive and moving both. Thank you so much, Chris. Well, thank you for having me. It's been really tremendous. Yes, indeed. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Really good. <laughs>